Okay, now it's time for our main program. Since we're going to be airing this program locally and on the World Wide Web, let me start with a disclaimer. Today's appearance before our club does not imply any sort of endorsement of this candidate. And Senator Cantwell is currently scheduled to speak to us on October 25th. That being said, I personally want to welcome Mike and thank him for joining us today. We are honored to have you here, sir. And to introduce the candidate and facilitate the question and answer session, please welcome an outstanding newsman, a member of our club, Q13 Fox Evening News anchor, Mark Wright. President Bill, thanks very much. And don't feel bad about the sign that fell down in college. Our weather graphics on our, on our uh, broadcasting, you know, little broadcast that used to fall down during our show, during college. Fellow Rotarians and distinguished guests, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, we're going to have some question and answer uh, period right after Mr. McGavick is done speaking. So uh, during the applause at the end, if you could queue up right over here on the right-hand side, you can ask a question. Many of you probably know Mike McGavick as the former president and CEO of Safeco Insurance, but his political career actually started first. As a 21-year-old college senior at the UW, McGavick signed up to work on Slade Gordon's U.S. Senate campaign. Over the years, he worked for Gordon as an aide, a campaign manager, and chief of staff. He's been campaigning hard. Earlier this summer, I passed a bus near the gorge on I-90. I thought it was a rock and roll bus. I was ready to go, woo! It, it said, open mic. McGavick Tour 2006, so he's been hitting the back roads of Washington State all summer long. Uh, he and his wife, Galen, have three boys, the youngest seven, the oldest 18. Today we are giving him the mic to learn more about his desire to become a U.S. Senator. Please welcome Mr. Mike McGavick. I hope you'll not be offended when I tell you that this is not my first speech today. <laughs> in fact, I would like to share with you, though, that my earlier speech was in front of a group of junior statesmen from all around Washington State. And I do want to encourage you to have great faith in the future, because if you were in that room with me, you would share with me the enthusiasm about what these bright kids are going to do with this world. It was a remarkable group. But I feel obligated to share with you what I shared with them. And that was the fact that I absolutely believe, more than perhaps I ever have, that this state is uniquely called by virtue of its situation in the globe, by virtue of its many blessings, and by virtue of its people to play a unique and major role in the betterment of mankind in the decades ahead. And given the state of the world as we know it today, I think we'd better get to work. We have a lot to do. I see there as being four main challenges. And I told these kids today that I believe they will spend the better part of their leadership lives working on these challenges as well, which tells us for certain they will dominate our time. Number one, the eradication of terrorism and the bigotry and hatred that fuels it. Number two, the fact that our society is aging, and this will put enormous stress on our pension systems and on the medical delivery that all of us depend on. Number three, the fact that globalization will bring us all closer together and make faraway poverty our near it mind problem with the disease that comes with it, but will also unlock economic opportunity, which can't help but be a little frightening to us as the most prosperous nation on earth. And then fourth, the simple truth that the earth is warming and that we will have to change the way in which we engage in both economic and energy policy, as well as our approach to environmental issues, if we are to assure that our children and their children's children enjoy a better planet than we have enjoyed. I believe in these four challenges, everything rides. Every issue can be traced back to them. Now, I should tell you, as a matter of disclaimer, 
that I did not come up with this by going off to some heavy breathing think tank. In fact, my optimism that our region will play a unique view was largely confirmed by riding around on a 30 plus foot bright red bus all over this state. Thousands of miles, hundreds of meetings, thousands of people with whom we're engaged. And it was meeting with those people that confirmed to me that we are already at work on these things, but we have so very much more to do. You know, I will, though, further disclaim that if you're going to be on an RV tour for that long, you will have moments of delusion without doubt. <laughs> and my first great moment of delusion was when I tried to sell the RV tour to my wife as a wonderful summer family vacation. I didn't get very far. In fact, I referred immediately to the comedy RV and said, it'll be great, kids. And my wife said, you are no Robin Williams. <laughs> it degenerated after that. Now, I did get everybody to come. You have to understand, I grew up here in Seattle. And I grew up camping all around the state. In fact, I can always tell a fellow native if you immediately have a reaction to the words, damp canvas. <laughs> huh? That's how I grew up, right? And I thought, well, this was a chance to share that with my family. We'll go to all those old campsites, you know. I'll give a few speeches here and there. Well, it didn't work very well. Here's how it went. We went out the first place. We were in Cedro Willie for a parade. Kids loved that. Saw some fireworks July 4th night in Semiamu. That, that was pretty cool. But the next day, we went down to Oak Harbor, and we had one of these open mic events. About 80 people got together to talk about issues. About 10 minutes into it, I could see in the very back of the room my seven-year-old Marco with his head down on the table, pounding it like this. <laughs> Unless you go call Child Protective Services, we started ferrying the kids on and off of the trip <laughs> at that point. But you know, I did learn from this trip that we're already deeply at work in this state on these challenges and that we have so very much to contribute. With respect to terrorism, and hatred and bigotry, let me give you a few things that we need to be working on soon here. You know, in most states in this nation that have a significant physical military presence in their state, there is an ongoing effort to connect the communities to the military facilities in their community, and an ongoing effort to defend those installations against other states that might seek to have them removed for their, for their benefit, right? Because, you know, every few years they go through this base realignment and closing commission where they argue about which bases matter the most. Most every state with a presence like ours, and we are very significantly present in the military forces, has an active, continuous effort to remain connected to those military installations and to support them throughout time. We're one of the few that does not. This is a mistake. This could lead our role in defending democracy to be lesser not for the right reasons, but rather for political reasons. And we have work to do to come together behind these bases. We're one of the few states that does not. It is an economic risk, and it is a defense risk to this country. The second thing that we need to do is take seriously the threat of terrorism on our own borders and in our ports. We hear so much about the southern border these days, do we not? But I think we would all do well to remember that the Millennium Bomber was caught on our border at Port Angeles. I've seen the documents he filled out. And for those who think passport's the solution, I want to make it clear, he had three valid passports with him. Three. And I have always thought that for my taste, it was too slender a read on which to defend democracy that that customs agent had a second cup of coffee that day. Technology is going to be the key to securing this northern border, and we are too slow to respond, and the same is true of the ports. The 9-11 Commission continues to give us a failing grade in addressing the threat to our ports and to our well-being by entry therein. And you can't wait till it's here, can you? We have to know what's coming. And then the third thing. We have been a trading community forever. That's where we come from. And by virtue of being a trading community, we live at the crossroads of many peoples. 
having sat down with Muslim leaders in our community, striving to be understood at this time in the world, have sat down with Jewish leaders, struggling to comprehend the senseless violence visited upon us so recently, having sat down with all these different people present in our community, I know this. We can help the world understand how to understand each other better because we live at a crossroads of humankind. We know how to trade with others and we can help people grasp the central need to come together as peoples beyond these old hatreds and old divisions, living with open minds and open hearts far past them. We do it better here in most places and we owe it to the world to help the rest of the world do it better as well. If we do not, I fear that violence will always be the solution that is proffered. And I see this nation too often turning to violence to solve the problems of the world in recent decades. The second issue that I referred to that I think will dominate is this idea that we're getting older. It's just a fact. It used to be many workers supported few who had retired. And those few who had retired, put bluntly, didn't live very long. Now it's the reverse. Few support the many, and the many are living a long time indeed. This is a good thing, but it is an economically difficult thing. And two things are deeply imperiled. The fact is that if we look at our social security system, our private pension system, and our public pension system, all are at risk of being underfunded or failing as this dynamic changes, as this demographic changes, courses through the economic system. We're already finding major corporations unable to meet their promises, and we know we have not yet stepped up to reform of these major social programs. This will be worked on for decades, I suspect. But the fact is, we need to keep these commitments if it's to work. And here again, I find the Northwest already at work. Let's not lose sight of the ingenuity that gave the world the first HMO. We should remember that we used to be a hotbed of redesigning how it is that the world takes care of one another, how healthcare is provided, and it needs to be reinvented yet again. But I also remember from my road show that as I traveled into Bellingham or traveled into Spokane, you saw a lot of Canadian license plates in the healthcare facilities there. That's why I'm not inclined to go that direction because I believe we need to use the free enterprise system to provide health care to our fellow citizens. And we have a lot of work to do to reduce the role of the middlemen in that process. But this is a dire need because this society cannot afford double-digit medical inflation forever. It just won't work. Nor can we afford the horrible truth that so many are uninsured in our society due to these rising costs. It just won't work. This ingenuity needs to be unleashed again. And again, I see our state at the heart of it. But it's also true that our state is at the heart of the best of the promise. Because through the research being done at the universities of Washington and WSU, we see the kind of breakthrough in health research that is making longer lives more able to be productive. I don't think we're going to need to raise the retirement age. I think people living longer more productively will want to produce, will want to participate. And that will change the economic equation by itself. But that makes that research on how life is extended in a positive way ever more important. And that's why I thought it was such a terrible idea to try and limit where science was going to take us. We have to be mindful of ethical boundaries without doubt. But we also ought to know what stem cells offer our future. And we're going to learn a lot of it right here at our universities. Right here at our universities. The third thing that I mentioned was globalization and the fact that globalization is bringing whole new challenges to bear. I mentioned three. Poverty, which of course is consequ the consequence of starvation. Disease. And then third, trade. And the fear we have of trade in the current environment. In all of those areas, Washington already contributes to the solution. In fact, it is extraordinarily exciting. With respect to poverty and, and starvation, we are one of the world's great breadbaskets, and we must keep this work going. And one of the most important things we have to do is to make sure that we do not keep talking casually on the west side of the state about the need for water on the east side of this state. The fact is we're a breadbasket to the world because of those dams, 
And we must keep them in place if we're going to continue to, to feed the world. We can solve for the salmon, and we should, but we must do it otherwise than threatening the entire basis of the Eastern Washington economy, which is what we do when we talk loosely about removing the dams. The second way in which we'll contribute to what the prospect for globalization most brightly offers is the notion that we can help solve the diseases of the world, again, through the research I referenced a moment ago. And it will be something I believe humankind will be grateful for forever, that Bill Gates has decided to step aside from his current success and apply that great mind and all those resources to trailing disease. It is one of the great blessings. And it's not a bad thing that Warren Buffett kicked in a little spare change, too. <laughs> this is something our region should strive to be known for and is worth being known for. But we all have something to do, too. Do we know that the University of Washington's facilities are inadequate to recruit all of the great brains we're trying to recruit? Do we know that's a public obligation, not just Bill Gates and Warren Buffett's job? So I challenge everyone here when you leave, Go to the UW Foundation or the UW Medical School website or go to the website uh, for WSU or go to the foundation there or go on EBRI or go on the Hutch and give something to this cause because it's how this region will most distinguish itself into the future is what we do to contribute to well-being around the globe. It is one of the great economic opportunities as well, but we have an investment to make ourselves. And then in the third way, competition. I want to make it clear. I fear no nation when it comes to competition. None. The ingenuity of American capitalism, American-style democracy will prevail. In that, I have no fear. And so I don't agree with those who would erect barriers to trade or the free exchange of goods. I feel in the reverse, that we should be constantly using our policies to lower barriers and unfairnesses to trade. Because I notice something very profound. It's not only good for us as a long-time trading post, but it also, those who trade together tend not to war with one another. It brings the world closer together and makes us ever more interdependent. But if we're not going to fear it, we've got to win it, right? Let's compete. And the fact is, our education system today is not preparing our children to compete. And here are a couple of charters. Number one, number one, I really want to compliment Governor Gregoire and the Gates Foundation for what they're doing on early childhood learning. I think it is the single most important thing we as a society could be working on. And there's an organization called Business Partnership for Early Learning. If your business isn't already contributing, I encourage you to do so. Because if we can capture those young minds, particularly those young minds that are currently destined to intergenerational poverty and turn them on to learning, we will never regret it. This society will forevermore be better off. The fact is that we have not made that commitment yet, and it's time. It's really time. Similarly, at the other end of the education spectrum, I am so embarrassed that a party with which I affiliate, the Republican Party, has proposed cutting Bell Pell Grants, the loans made to higher education. That makes zero sense in a world where we need to compete more, not less. We have got to get the job done in getting more children better educated, period and we must commit the, society, the resources in this society to do so. Now, if we educate, we will compete and we will win, and we don't need barriers. And I would remind everyone who argues for barriers that the last time we tried breaking up the world and preventing trade, it led directly to depression, directly to depression. None of us should go back to that kind of policy. We just need to win the competition. And then finally, on global warming. Now, you know, I have to say that you've been very tolerant of me. I can remember when I was last introduced to this group, I was introduced as a civic and business leader, perhaps too, generous to, too gener uh, generously to be fair, but that's how I was introduced the last time. Now I'm introduced to you as another one of these politicians. How far I've fallen. But the reality is that global warming is another uniquely Northwestern opportunity, and I saw great evidence of that again last night. But let me state the problem to you this way. The fact is that none of us would live in Washington State if it wasn't beautiful and bountiful. Face facts, it rains a lot. 
it rained. You'd get out of here. It's too wet. And on the east side, it's too dry. That's the reality. But it is beautiful, and it is bountiful, and we do owe that to our children. And I saw a great illustration of the spirit we have that we need to teach the rest of the world when I attended the event last night in honor of Jim Ellis, celebrating the Mountain to Sounds Greenway. Perfect example of something that wasn't imposed from on high, but rather a group of citizens got together and got done. And I sat at a table with a guy who was a developer in King County who said, I remember when this started. I thought it was crazy. I now think it's one of the best things our region has ever done. Typical of Jim Ellis to change everyone's hearts and minds. We know how to do that kind of approach to environmental issues better here than anywhere in the world, and we'd better teach it to the rest of the world pretty darn soon. Pretty darn soon. Because it is time is not on our side when it comes to global warming. And let me tell you something. You would be excited to know that as I traveled around Washington State, here you could see the energy going on. And I mean energy. I saw biomass fuel plants being drawn up or designed in Cedar Woolley. I saw one being designed in Forks. I saw another proposal for biofuels plant that's going in uh, down in Grays Harbor. Saw another one when I met with a farmer who was changing his crop rotation when I was over in Pomeroy. It didn't matter where you went, people were investing and using their ingenuity in alternative fuels. This we will be a leader in. This will help the problem. And in the meanwhile, the Congress has got some really, really good work to do to make sure that companies like BP are filling their obligations, huh? Because we're about to be hurt. We've been hurt twice in this country now by that company. An explosion in Texas not too many years ago, and now corrosion in the pipes that supplies us with gas. This is going to hurt. And anybody who used to believe that Alaska oil wasn't relevant to the price of gas, watch your fuel pump these next few months. We're going to learn there is a relationship right quick. We have got to invest in infrastructure while we transition to these alternative fuels, and we need to help the rest of the world do so as well. We can't let them make all the same mistakes we've made. And neither can we just require that they don't grow, because that's not fair. But I will say that when it comes to the environment, if we've had much work to do, we still have a balance to strike, a balance to strike. And I want to tell you a story that affected me very much. How many of you know where Republic Washington is? That's a pretty good group. So if you go to, cent if you go to Eastern Washington, you go about the center and go straight up, you'll find Republic up in the hills up there, okay? We did one of these open mic tours there. 80 people came out in lunch at midweek to talk about the issues. It was cool. By the way, for those who don't know, 80 people is about 8% the population of Republic Washington. And we talked a lot about a fire that had happened in Sherman Pass, just outside of Republic, back in 1989. Now, this fire was on active timberland. Not in wilderness, not parks. It was active timberland. But after the fire happened, there were lawsuits about whether or not that timber could be salvaged. And it was blocked from being salvaged. In fact, as you drive through Sherman Pass, you'll still see the charred remains lying on their side. Again, this was active timberland, forest land, that was meant to be used. But these lawsuits blocked it. Now, there used to be a timber mill in Republic, Washington. It was the mainstay of the economy up there. And that mill is still in operation in China. Imagine what it must have been like packing up your family and your belongings and driving through Sherman Pass, seeing all of that timber rotting on the ground, knowing it would lead to disease and perhaps additional fires, that the forest wasn't being replanted as could have been, and knowing that your government had not allowed you to harvest that timber even though had it stood, you would have been harvesting it and you would have kept your job. Does that sound like the kind of balance we're trying to strike? We do such great things here, from the shared strategy on salmon on the sound to the work we're doing in the Cascade Lands Conservancy. We do such great work when we work together in balance and harmony to solve problems. And we send it off to the judge. We don't get consensus. We get edicts, and they're often wrong. We have to do this ourselves because we will do it right. No one has a greater stake. Now, I've tried to speak optimistically about work we're already doing and can do right at hand to affect these four issues. 
I will just leave you with the thought that there's one thing that stands in the way, in my opinion, to an extraordinary future and contribution by our region. And that one thing is the bitter and senseless partisanship and incivility that dominates public conversation these days. We have got to learn again how to disagree without being disagreeable. We really need this change. I'll tell you, I think we got a dose of what's coming in the election last night. You know, look, I don't agree with Joe Lieberman on much at all. I want to be clear. He and I have a very different view of the world. But I greatly admire him because he always stood for what he believed. You could count on that notion. He was willing to stand apart from his party from time to time. I really admired that. He paid for it last night. I'm going to be sending him a contribution. I think the Senate has too few Joe Liebermans, not too many. We need more independent leaders and not any more partisan foot soldiers in the United States Senate. I hope these are the issues that you've been thinking about. I hope I've encouraged you that Washington State has a unique role to play. We can give to our children a better world without question. And we are going to do it. We are going to do it. But the reality is if we aren't willing to tackle these issues and talk about them with open hearts and open minds and solve our problems for ourselves, then that group of kids that I looked at this morning, we will let them down. We're not going to do that, are we? Thank you very much for your time here today. I greatly appreciate it. It's great. Thank you. Well, thanks. I want to thank everyone who helped to make this such a great program. I especially want to thank Mark Wright for his professional expertise. Vic Gray, uh, we miss having you as a member, but it is a long commute from Port Townsend. Thanks for coming back over here today. And as you saw the people raise their hands, we may be inviting you back again and have a bigger program. Thank you. Senator Evans, sir, it's always an honor to have you join us. Uh, thank you. I hope you'll come back. And Mike, uh, thank you for having the courage to stand for election in these difficult times. And win or lose, I hope you'll come back and see us. Next week, August 16th, we'll meet at the Westin. Our speaker will be Jim Giambalvo, Dean of the UW School of Business. And we're also going to learn more about our Centennial Project. And finally, rule number six in the 50 Pretty Good Rules. I learned this one in the Navy when I had to hand out punishment. Never be vindictive. When doling out punishment, always err on the side of leniency. See you next week. We are adjourned. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, now providing return to work services that help get absent employees back to their jobs. Healthy employees produce healthy companies at First Choice Health. And by Enterprise Seattle. For over 35 years, Enterprise Seattle has provided client-based economic development services to businesses throughout King County and its 39 cities. More information on Enterprise Seattle and how they help businesses grow and prosper can be found at www.enterpriseseattle.org. Mm -hmm.